Now, I'm not the best at math, but that's two seconds longer than the M1 Max. When Apple announced these computers, I was super intrigued by what they were capable of and how I could implement it into my workflow. I originally decided to pick up the M1 Max Mac Studio when it came out because just back in December, I picked up the 16 inch M1 Pro MacBook Pro and I knew if I was impressed by the speed and capability of that base model, that this one would just give me that extra push and that extra speed that I wanted in a system for a very reasonable price. Now I had zero intentions of even reviewing the M1 Ultra, but I had the opportunity to get my hands on it and I couldn't pass it up. So in today's video, I'm going to talk about my overall impressions of the Mac Studio, as well as show you some speed tests that I did between the M1 Max, the M1 Ultra, and the M1 Pro that's in my MacBook Pro. Just a quick disclaimer, I'm gonna be testing the speeds of these from the perspective of a video editor who uses Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve. So if you are a Final Cut Pro user, or maybe you're looking into this computer for other reasons aside from video and photo, I will let you know when to skip ahead so that you don't have to watch a bunch of stuff that you don't care about. So let's get started in this video with my first impressions of the Mac Studio. The unboxing experience was what you would expect from Apple. They always know how to give you that extra touch and they go the extra mile whenever you purchase one of their products. It's super minimal. It literally just comes with the Mac Studio and then the power cable and of course the Apple instruction manuals and all that, but that's it. I actually, whenever I opened it originally, I had to go to the product page and double check to make sure I wasn't missing anything. The looks and the design of this is awesome. I mean, it's an Apple product, so you're gonna be getting that Apple design. It's one of those products that you don't feel like you have to hide away in a corner of your desk to make the desk look nice. You can have it setting up there kind of as a statement piece and it's gonna look great. Now, obviously this is thicker from the older Mac minis and that's with good reason. I mean, the thermals that they put in this thing is pretty incredible. So it pretty much lifts air from the bottom up and through the back. And you can really feel that fan kicking on whenever it's sitting there and it's on. Now you don't hear the fan, it's very low. And I've heard some people complaining about the fan noise. So I think those people complaining about that have obviously never had a custom PC. Even at the heaviest renders that I've put this thing through so far, I've never heard that fan kick on, similar to the new MacBook Pros. On the front, you have two USB-C or Thunderbolt if you have the Ultra version. And then you also have an SD card reader, which they obviously brought back with the newest MacBook Pros. And that's nice to have on the front of this because whenever you're working and you need to dump a card real quick, or maybe you're looking for footage and you have to plug in a hard drive, it's nice just to be able to plug it in right there. Now on the back of this thing, you get a bunch of ports. You've got four Thunderbolt 4 ports, a 10 gigabit ethernet port, two USB type A, an HDMI 2.0, and a headphone jack. Another thing I really like about this is the 10 gigabit ethernet port. Now this might not be beneficial for some people, but if you are working in a studio environment or maybe you're running off of a NAS server or any 10 gigabit server setup, whether it's fiber internet or something like that, you can plug straight into this without needing an adapter that goes through Thunderbolt. So it's just freeing up more ports for you. I'm really happy with all the ports that they decided to add into this because it really gives it that desktop feel. It never feels like you're fighting for ports. Everything's running out of the back. So if it's setting on the back of your desk, you can have all those cables running through and it's just gonna give your whole desk setup a cleaner look. There are speakers on this thing. Um, they exist and they make noises but I don't think you're ever gonna really need to use them. Now, one gripe I do have about the design of this is the bottom here doesn't really have a grippy side to it. So this is like a rubber or plastic gasket, um, which you would think would keep it sitting on a desk or a countertop without sliding around. But one issue I've had is it slides super easy. So anytime I'm trying to plug in something from the front, just gonna move back and so I have to put two hands on it to plug things in. It's kind of a minor inconvenience, but I might try to find like a third party ring. I'm sure they'll start releasing like a ring that you could put on this that has more of a gel surface to keep it stuck to your desk. When it comes to the design of the M1 Max and the M1 Ultra, they're basically identical minus the front ports, of course. In the Ultra, you get two Thunderbolt ports. On the Max, you only get two USB-C ports. Not really a big deal, especially if you're mixing Thunderbolt drives and you have USB-C drives. It hasn't really been an issue for me so far. The M1 Ultra version is heavier than the M1 Max. I only had a food scale, so I had to put it in grams. So who's this computer for? Now, Apple obviously is pushing it towards the market of the prosumer who needs a system that can handle everything. I think this is a similar market to those who purchased the Mac Pro, except for this, Apple is giving you the option to get a lot of power for a cheaper price, and you don't necessarily have to go for the most extreme option. 
Now, is this computer right for everybody? Absolutely not. If you're even considering between a Mac Studio or a laptop, go with the laptop, especially if this is going to be your only setup. I would always prioritize portability before getting a desktop setup. Unless you're 100% only going to use a computer at home or even from a desk, like if you don't even want the option to sit on your couch and do work, then maybe it's fitting. But I would say if you're thinking, I can get an M1 Max and all of this stuff for $2,000 versus $2,800 or $3,000, I would spend the extra money and get the MacBook Pro because you're getting the screen, you're getting that portability, that amazing battery life. I just think overall, it's not even a question. For me personally, I've always ran multiple setups. I've always had either a MacBook Pro and an iMac or two MacBook Pros or most recently a MacBook Pro and a PC. As a freelance creative, I can't just rely on a single machine because oftentimes I'm editing a video for a client and while that's rendering, I'm using my other machine to work on the next task for the day. So I'm trying to maximize my time and I can't really do that if I'm relying on one single machine. Now, when it comes to the performance of the M1 Max, I was curious how it would perform compared to my M1 Pro MacBook Pro that I have because I wanted to make sure I didn't have a redundant setup. I didn't need two computers that were going to perform the same. So I was hoping that the M1 Max would give me at least a little bit of a speed increase. It didn't need to be life-changingly fast, but something that I could warrant keeping it as an additional setup. Now this isn't gonna be a benchmark driven video just because I'm not really a data geek when it comes to that stuff, but here's the initial benchmarks that I ran and they were somewhat similar to each other. The single core CPU test was the most similar across the board. Now, this makes sense because from the CPU side, they are pretty similar minus the Ultra, in theory should be double. The M1 Pro scored at 1752, the M1 Max running at 1760, and the M1 Ultra running at 1741, which is actually the lowest. Um, there's probably a ton of other factors that I'm not thinking about because I'm not an expert when it comes to this stuff, but these are just the initial benchmarks that I ran and I got. When it came to the multi-core side, things were a little different with the M1 Pro scoring 12,056, the M1 Max scoring at 12,556, and the M1 Ultra scoring at 22,511. So when it comes to the multi-core performance, the Ultra is literally double the performance. Now on the GPU side, I knew that the Max and the Ultra were going to perform better because they are heavily upgraded on the GPU side. The M1 Pro scored 37,862, the M1 Max scored 50,372, and the M1 Ultra scored 77,220. Now I think a benchmark test is good for some people and it's helpful for some people. For me personally, it's kind of hard to translate numbers into actual performance because you're just seeing numbers and I think psychologically it's easier to just pick the highest number and assume that that's the best and everything else is slow. But you gotta remember that just a couple months ago we were Googling over the fact that an M1 Max had the performance that it did and still does. But for me, I wasn't going to truly know the performance of these computers until I tested it out in situations that were actually what I was going to use it for. Now, if you're not a video editor or you use Final Cut Pro and you don't care about any of the things I'm about to show you, then just skip to this part of the video where I talk about other things about the Mac Studio. So I broke the test down into three different portions. The first one being in Premiere Pro. This project was a six camera multicam shoot that I did last year and everything was shot in 4K on the Canon C300 Mark II. I started by scrubbing an unrendered timeline and honestly, between all three of the computers, they all performed almost identical. They were able to play with zero drop frames and they were able to play back all of the footage pretty fine, except for the MacBook Pro would get snagged on clips here and there. And if I were to disable a clip while playing, the MacBook Pro would get snagged up a little easier uh, than the Mac Studio and the M1 Ultra was the only one that was really able to handle it without dropping frames. But still overall, I could play through and scrub through with no issues. It would take like a microsecond for it to jump up to 24 frames and then there was pretty much no drop frames except for on the MacBook Pro. Now one thing to consider with that is the MacBook Pro was generating peaks and it took a lot longer for it to generate peaks in that project. And that had to do with some of the snags that it was getting caught up on in the unrendered timeline. But I reran the project later on after all of the clips had generated and it definitely sped up and I didn't see as many snags when, when scrubbing and playing through, but still it was more susceptible to dropping frames as the other computers did. Next up, I wanted to see how fast I could add a warp stabilizer to one of the clips. So I chose a 16 second clip and just dropped the warp stabilizer right on it. 
The MacBook Pro rendered it at one minute and one second. The Mac Studio M1 Max rendered it at 35 seconds. And the Mac Studio M1 Ultra rendered it at 37 seconds. Now I'm not the best at math, but that's two seconds longer than the M1 Max. After that, I decided to render the timeline just using one of the songs. So the clip was three minutes and 53 seconds. The MacBook Pro rendered it at two minutes and 50 seconds. The Mac Studio M1 Max rendered it at a minute and 27 seconds. And the M1 Ultra rendered it at one minute and 23 seconds. After that, I exported the clip at 4K using high bitrate and match source. The MacBook Pro rendered it out at three minutes and 36 seconds. The Mac Studio M1 Max rendered it at a minute and 56 seconds. And the Mac Studio M1 Ultra rendered it at a minute and 25 seconds. So a little bit of an increase there, nothing insane, but honestly the biggest change came from the MacBook Pro versus the Mac Studio M1 Max. After running these tests, I was a little concerned about the M1 Ultra, but I have to remember that Adobe and Blackmagic have not optimized their products for the M1 Ultra. They have optimized it for M1 Pro and M1 Max, so I think naturally those are running at their fastest. Now I'm hoping that's the case and I could be wrong, but usually it takes a little bit of time for Adobe and Blackmagic to actually optimize for these chips. And that's why the Final Cut Pro editors who are watching this video are probably laughing at me. After finishing that test, I decided to open one more Premiere project before switching to DaVinci. And I opened up one of my latest office tour videos that I just posted. I shot most of it on the Canon C70, but it was also mixed with red Komodo raw footage. I went straight to scrubbing the unrendered timeline. I had the same performance as the last test where basically all three computers were handling it fine with the caveat that the MacBook Pro would get snagged on footage a little easier than the, Ma the M1 Max. First up, I decided to add a warp stabilizer to a seven second clip. The MacBook Pro did it in 23 seconds, the M1 Max doing it in 19 seconds, and the Ultra analyzed it at 19 seconds. So again, the M1 Ultra and the M1 Max were pretty similar. Next up, I exported the clip, same settings. I did high bit rate, match source, so I was exporting out an H.264 4K clip, and it was 17 minutes long. And the MacBook Pro M1 Pro rendered it out in 16 minutes and 15 seconds. The Mac Studio M1 Max rendered it at 12 minutes and 31 seconds. And the Mac Studio M1 Ultra rendered it at 12 minutes and 20 seconds. There was really no increase in speed between the M1 Max and the Ultra. After that, I moved over into DaVinci Resolve, which is where I do all of my coloring and also where I'm trying to move my workflow over completely. So I was hoping to see a little more performance out of the M1 Max and the M1 Ultra. So I grabbed a couple clips that I had shot on the Red Raptor. Most of them shot in 6K and a couple in 8K, all at 60 and 120 frames per second. So I knew these were gonna be beefy and they would take a lot more to play properly. Initially, I noticed that within DaVinci Resolve, I was able to play back all of the clips with absolutely no issue, but this is kind of a given. I mean, there's no effects or colors or anything in there yet, so it's not being bogged down. I'm just playing the source footage. After that, I just added a basic color pass. I didn't even really look at what I was doing. I just wanted to add a couple things in there to just layer on top of the footage. Still, I had no issues, no drop frames, and all three computers played it fine. But one thing that I did notice was the M1 Max and the M1 Ultra just had a smoother feel when it came to adjusting the color wheels and adding nodes and stuff like that. And that's not to say that the MacBook Pro was super slow, it's just that was the only difference that I really noticed. Next up, I added a warp stabilizer to one clip that was a minute and 37 seconds. The Mac Studio M1 Max rendered it in one minute and 15 seconds. The MacBook Pro analyzed it in one minute and 24 seconds and the M1 Ultra did it in 52 seconds. Next up, I added a noise reduction because I really wanted to push the limits of these computers and noise reduction is notoriously just awful to work with. After I added the noise reduction to all the clips, the MacBook Pro was running at five to six frames per second. The M1 Max was running eight to nine frames per second and the M1 Ultra was running 14 to 15 frames per second. So all three of these were only able to handle that much. Now, it pretty much makes sense based on the benchmarks of where those were sitting. Now, I would actually be surprised to see what kind of computer could actually handle that. I would guess two 3090s in a PC might be able to do something, but this test was pretty accurate to what I was expecting. 
After I ran those tests, I decided to export each individual clip as if I were coloring all the footage and getting ready to throw it into Premiere Pro to edit a video. So I had the render settings at H.264, full quality, match source, so I was going to be exporting 6K clips and also 8K clips. I took off the noise reduction because that would have just taken way too much time to export, but I did have uh, the warp stabilizer on all of the clips and just a slight color pass. And this is where things got really interesting. The MacBook Pro M1 Pro took an hour and 10 minutes to render, and the M1 Max took 41 minutes and 22 seconds, which is almost half the time. And then the M1 Ultra rendered it in 37 minutes and 15 seconds. So only a couple minute difference there. So when it came to that test alone, I was very impressed by the render times in the M1 Max versus the MacBook Pro. And I think overall, I noticed that the biggest performance increases are really just in the rendering. And again, I really think that these applications just aren't optimized for the Ultra chip yet. So we're not really getting the true speeds that we can out of it. At least I hope that's the case. Hey, what's up, Future Jordan here. Um, I'm just finishing up the edit on this review video and I just wanted to add in a couple notes that weren't included in this video. So after editing this video, I spent some time using both the Ultra and the M1 Max. And I did notice in Premiere that the playhead when I'm scrubbing through the timeline would get stuck on the M1 Max. Now, this might be a Premiere issue, this might not be a speed issue, but I noticed that issue here and there, which was kind of annoying, but the M1 Ultra did not have that issue. So that right there was kind of a point to Ultra um, if that is the case of speed. And I guess that makes sense from the CPU side because it's double the cores as the M1 Max. After that, I switched the project into DaVinci Resolve and it was a completely different story. Obviously, DaVinci Resolve is going to favor the GPU side and so I've had absolutely no issues on the M1 Max editing this whole thing. I brought in the M1 Ultra and again, some speed increases, but for the most part, the M1 Max was just flying through. I haven't had any issues. I'm about to finish up the edit right now, but I just wanted to throw that in so that there was a little more of a real world test and not just render tests. All right, let's finish up the video here. Overall, I was very impressed with the M1 Max. For that price point, you really are getting a solid amount of performance out of it. I think it's still a little early for me to fully know which one works better for me, but I can say last night I was editing everything up until this point of the video, and I was mixing in between my Ultra and my M1 Max. Not really a proficient editing setup, but I wanted to get the best of both worlds and really test them out, and I found myself more impressed working on the Mac Studio. Not necessarily from a speed standpoint, but I never felt myself wishing I had more when I was on the Mac M1 Max. And that alone really makes me think maybe the M1 Max is a perfect suit for me. Now, if I were to custom order one, I would probably go one core higher with the M1 Max, which is like a $200 edition. And then I would increase the internal SSD and also the RAM. And still, I think by doing that, you're still sitting at under $3,500, maybe even under 3,000. Hi, uh, yeah, me again. I just wanted to add to this real quick as well that I think the Ultra definitely has a place. Now, if you are doing any sort of 3D work or you are a music producer and you're heavily reliant on GPU and RAM because you run a lot of plugins, I think that would benefit you way more than it would benefit me. Someone who does a lot of video editing and coloring in DaVinci Resolve, but I'm by no means an expert level colorist who is tracking eyeballs all day and needs all of that GPU and RAM to function. So I just wanted to throw that in there because I don't want it to sound like I'm saying the Ultra has no place. I think it has a very specific place depending on what your needs are. But let me know in the comments what you think I should do. Should I hold on to the Ultra because in a couple of months it's going to be a speed demon and I'm gonna be happy that I kept it? Or should I be happy with the M1 Max and just continue working on that because of the cost savings that I have from it? I always love chatting with everyone in the YouTube comments because you guys are able to give me a perspective that I'm not seeing, um, so having that third party kind of let me know some things that I might be forgetting is always nice. If you did enjoy this video and it did help you with your decision making, be sure to give it a thumbs up, say hello to me in the comments, and if you're not already, subscribe to the channel. I'm gonna be putting out a lot more of these type of videos. Hopefully you guys enjoy them, because uh, I have a blast making them. But until the next one, I will see you all later.